Really nice to have you here. Uh, these are Chelsea Football Club. We're going to get to it. We're going to get to it. Um, Might have heard of it. Anyway, uh, really nice to have you here in New York. Came all, all the way across the country. You were in London last week. Um, all right, so as I was thinking about this interview, thinking about the world of PE, thinking about the world of sports, but let's start in private equity because when you name um, the top 10 or so private equity firms by assets under management, um, sort of get down and you're like, Clear Lake. Google Clear Lake. <laughs> uh, you have been surprisingly and very intentionally under the radar. Mm -hmm. Tell us about this firm that you founded in 2006. <laughs> well, first of all. Very few people know about. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, thank you for, for having me here. Uh, yeah, we. Uh, uh, so clearly, Capital Group. You know, we founded the firm in 2006. Uh, today, we manage about 70 billion uh, under management. Uh, about 75, you know, percent of that is in traditional private equity, uh, where we're investing primarily in technology, industrials, a little bit of consumer. Um, we're a little bit unusual in the sense that we can do anything from a traditional buyout all the way to, um, you know, carve outs, turnarounds, distress. Uh, and then about 25% of the AUM is in, in credit. You know, all various forms of credit, everything from CLOs uh, to direct uh, uh, direct credit uh, to structure equity, et cetera, et cetera. And so what's the, how do you come up with that playbook? You and Badad, he comes from TPG, you come via Tenenbaum and mm -hmm. um, worked on Wall Street before that. What did you see in the market that wasn't there? Yeah, well, um, like every entrepreneur, we had the, the, the belief, maybe unfounded, that, uh, that we had a different idea, a different way of doing things, a different way of looking at things. Uh, for us, it was having the experience of having seen or having invested, uh, you know, kind of going back to 2001, 2003, 2005, 2006. If you look back at that period, there was, a, you know, parts of that uh, kind of economic cycle that were actually very healthy, and then we had periods of distress. And one of the things we noticed being, you know, from the, from the TPG vantage point, from the tenant bound vantage point, is that different firms, you know, were able to capture different parts of that cycle, but very few are able to invest across that economic and credit cycle. And we felt uh, that there was an opportunity to create a firm that had a few elements. One, uh, that was sector focused, not only one sector, but sector focused. And we definitely picked sectors very intentionally, sectors that we thought had significant secular growth, even, even if there was some cyclicality embedded in those sectors. Uh, but also, you know, very intentionally, we wanted to have a firm that had the capabilities to invest across that economic and credit cycle. And that meant, you know, understanding how to do a pure play uh, buyout, uh, but also understanding how to do more complicated deals. You know, how to basically look operationally at a company that was doing a carve out and, and executing on that carve out, or looking at a company that required uh, some help, you know, a turnaround situation, and even, you know, kind of a little bit more esoteric, right, you know, a little bit uh, more unique um, uh, capabilities of, you know, buying the debt and, 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 and getting control through the, through the debt in, in restructuring, so, you know, primarily in a friendly way. Uh, and I, we felt that we could combine all that, we could create, you know, something that was unique and a little bit different. Uh, and, you know, looking back now, almost 20 years after founding the firm, I think, I think we did capture a space in the market that was a little bit different. You know, there are a few other firms that can do what we do, but, but very few at our scale. And so you, you ultimately zero in, or, or really from the beginning, zero in tech, industrials, sort of consumer, but broadly defined. As you look across those at this moment in, in 2022, we've heard a lot throughout the day about, shall we say, some turbulence in the market. Um, People have been checking their Bloomberg throughout the day and being like, okay. Um, what do you see? I mean, what what's the lens or, or what's the sort of posture that you take in this market right now? Yeah. Well, unlike our previous uh, uh, interview, I'm not a macro investor. So so we look at things more from, from the micro perspective, you know, looking at companies, more the idiosyncratic risk that we're trying to capture. Uh, but broadly speaking, obviously, we are, one, testing uh, the, the the thesis, you know, in terms of technology, right? You know, kind of underlying technology is, you know, ad adoption trends, uh, really interesting growth trends. Obviously, we can argue about valuations in the tech space, but you know, by and large, those companies have been fairly resilient, uh, and we're seeing that in our portfolio. Uh, in the industrial space, uh, what we like to see is companies that can dominate their niche, 
you know, that can have pricing power, that have the ability to kind of be a, not a price taker, but, you know, a price setter in their industries. And you look for things that are more resilient, you know, where um, aftermarket is more important, where perhaps, you know, less CapEx, you know, less capital intensity, uh, things like that. We're going to see some cyclicality there. We're definitely seeing, you know, the effects of, uh, of the interest rate tightening that, that we're experiencing and the slowdown in the economy. There's no question about that. Um, in consumer, we actually have a very narrow lens, you know, which right now we haven't done a whole lot of, but, you know, there's still really interesting aspects of that space. For example, our largest company in that uh, space is a pet food business. You know, during the pandemic, uh, many of us decided to get a pet. And if you had a pet, you decided to get a second one, you know, a second dog or a second cat or whatever it is, you know, and that demand has been proven to be very resilient. At the moment, you know, what we're watching for is very quick, uh, very um, intently is when is the right time uh, to perhaps, you know, start looking at more, quote unquote, turnaround and distress opportunities. I would say they're still early, right? Okay. You know, I, I would expect a few more quarters of economic turmoil before it's really the, the buying opportunity is really there. Although, you know, it's impossible in our industry, in my industry at least, from my perspective, to time the bottom. Uh, and you have to buy uh, when you can. Yeah. Uh, so so we are, we're watching very closely right now. And what about selling? Are you are, are you seeing opportunities to to sell in your portfolio, or are you sort of holding still? Yeah, well, it's interesting, right? You know, I oftentimes people or our LPs ask us, when is the right time to sell a business, right? You know, there's only one good time to sell, which is when you can, and uh, and at the moment, it's not it's not a great time to sell a business, right? You know, why would you unless you have to sell a business? Um, you know, why would you, right? You know, it's a, we're in the middle of the storm. Uh, you know, the, the syndicated capital markets, particularly in credit, are practically closed. We haven't seen an IPO in, in a long time. So it's really not a great time to sell the business unless you have to, or unless a strategic with a lot of cash, and there are many of them, approaches you because they feel they must have your business, right? You know, so I think we will definitely look opportunistically at exits, and we actually have exited probably three or four businesses uh, from our portfolio this year. Um, but at the moment, right, you know, you, you, we would do that very selectively and only businesses where we think there's a significant amount of strategic interest. Um, I think the private equity bid right now is not great and the public markets are essentially closed. Yeah. And when you think about, we've heard a lot today and, and over the past few days, it, it feels like there have been a lot of people out in the world talking. Um, the financing market, like how do you find it? Because you're talking to banks all the time about yeah. their willingness to, to do things. I mean, there's obviously a very big transaction that needs to be uh, uh, financed very soon. But like, what do you see when you are, are, are talking with your, with your colleagues on the banking side? Yeah. So, so maybe, maybe I'll get a lot of emails and texts after this uh, from my banking friends because they'll say that their, their balance sheets are wide open and they're, uh, <laughs> they're willing to, uh, to back any and all uh, financings. But uh, I would say that the, the markets are very tight right now. Um, uh, the banks still have... It depends how you count, anywhere from 50 to $70 billion of, you know, kind of credit underwritings on their balance sheet. And on a mark-to-market -market basis, they're probably losing anywhere from 7 to $15 billion in those financings, right? You know, the, the, the new par is probably like 85 to 90. So, so I think banks are going to be very, very cautious to take on significant uh, materially more credit or underwriting credit um, or underwriting risk. Uh, before year end. And when you think about it, you know, any transaction that you sign up in the next three to six weeks is probably not going to close until next year. Right. And having, keeping that, you know, kind of credit risk uh, through the new year, uh, uh, you know, oftentimes is, is, is something that, you know, kind of the risk committees and the credit committees don't want to do. Right. So I think you're going to see a pretty, um, uh, you're going to see very little activity, I think, you know, in the financing markets, in the syndicated markets, in terms of new activity uh, through year end. You know, it was interesting, you know, trying to, you know, get to the bottom of your strategy. You know, you laid it out very nicely, and, you know, lo and behold, today you, you announced a, a deal. Uh, it's a really interesting one because it takes us into the, the sports arena a little bit. You acquired a business. To, you've got a platform called Victory Live, I, I believe. You acquired a new uh, company as part of that platform called Ticket Evolution. I dare say everyone in this room has bought a ticket to a sporting event. At, at some point, this is a really interesting business, and I think a window into 
consumer behavior in, in mm -hmm. some points. It, it gets to sports, it gets to live events, it gets to, you know, how we literally consume in, in many ways. Tell us a, l a little bit about that just because it's so fresh. Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, in many ways, it's the, it's the prototypical Clear Lake type of transaction. You know, as a, the founder of Victory Life uh, is somebody that we have partnered with now going almost 10 years. You know, somebody that we were successful with in an earlier investment, we exited. You know, the business that uh, he found that is now essentially the core of what today we call NFL and location. So, so somebody that we have known for a long time in a space that we have known, that we know very, very well. Um, it's also a space that we think is not only interesting for some of the things that you talked about, it's a space that, you know, plays to our strengths. You know, plays to the interplay of technology, data, consumer behavior. You know, all the things that we think are, you know, now, as we think about the world going forward, are extremely important um, to analyze not only consumer type businesses, but any type of business, right? You know, kind of every business arguably is a data business right now. You know, some of the most valuable assets that we have in traditional uh, industrial companies is actually data, behavior data, uh, maintenance data, uh, and, and, you know, Understanding that and having access to that is extremely valuable. You know, that is data after all is, is, is the engine or is the, the source of any model that you think about that, you know, it, it's based on AI, right? You know, you need the data first to be able to, to analyze it. So, so we think, uh, as you mentioned, right, you know, kind of the, a ticketing platform has many interesting aspects to it, but one of them is understanding or having a, a from row uh, seat to, uh, to that data and consumer behavior. All right. Sports. Got to talk about it. You wore the socks. Um, if you go through, you know, you go to your website, again, sort of look through, you're like, okay, interesting, interesting, interesting. Chelsea foot cl Football Club, what? Um, this was not uh, necessarily something that, that maybe people expected you guys to get into. And yet, as I've gotten to know you a little bit, this was not out of the blue. This was something that you guys had, had circled around and, and thought about. Take us into the thinking of buying hmm. a professional football club in London. Yeah. Well, first, you know, obviously, let's focus on the specific uh, situation here. And, and for one second, right, you know, I would ask you to, to you know, proverbially close your eyes and, and suspend this belief, right? You know, it's, um, and forget us, Chelsea Football Club in the Premier League. Uh, we're talking about a situation where you had a forced seller, very unusual situation, right? You know, where basically government, gover the government of the UK essentially was forcing the sale of the asset. Um, you had an asset that even though most people would consider a price asset, but it was not really run as a business. It was really run for other purposes, you know, but, but profit was not a, the ultimate at least goal or not even one of the, si the more significant goals of the business. Um, at the same time, it's a business that most people will say is, you know, kind of a beachfront property, one of the best properties in that in, in, in that sector, in that league, uh, in this case. Uh, and again, when you think about sports, it's really the interplay. What are, what are we really talking about? We're talking about live content media, right? You know, and how to monetize that media depends on some of the things that we're talking about, technology, data, right? You know, trying to understand consumer beha behavior. Um, so we fought essentially, so now go back to kind of, you know, Chelsea, we thought we had a really interesting opportunity to buy a business uh, in a very unique situation where, again, there was a forced seller, significant parts of the buyer market perhaps were not able to access, you know, the transaction. And we felt that, you know, all the core competen competencies of Clear Lake uh, came into play. On top of that, we were able to partner with uh, you know, Todd Bowley and his group, uh, a group that, you know, has a lot of experience, you know, in other uh, significant uh, leagues and significant teams, you know, the Dodgers, um, the Lakers, et cetera. So in many ways, it was, again, the prototypical uh, Clear Lake type of transaction where we had a great partner, a great, a really interesting situation. We were buying at what we thought was a great, uh, very interesting price. Uh, and a significant opportunity to transform the business and create a lot of value. Um, and then if you add on top of that the overlay that the English Premier League, in our opinion, is one of the better leagues to invest, one of the, one of the ones with the most significant upside uh, on a, a, on a long-term basis, 
we, we got pretty excited about it. Yeah. So a household name, to be sure, and you know, as, as exciting as uh, you know, Victory Live may, may be, <laughs> um, I'm guessing that you don't often have the experience that we had backstage, which was one of our team who was helping us get ready said, I'm sorry, did you say Chelsea? <laughs> um, what's it been like owning something and, and sort of getting into the world, both you know, here in the United States and, and in Europe and in London, as I mentioned, you were there just uh, last week, um, to own an asset that is this public? Yeah. Given that we started this conversation about how not public you are. Yeah. Well, it's been fascinating. You know, obviously, in the past 18 months, or you know, let's say 24 months, we probably have done uh, six or seven, probably done a dozen transactions, six or seven of which had an enterprise value greater than the value of Chelsea. But you, know, you may, because you maybe did a little more research than most, but most people in this room have, will have no clue about the other ones, right? You know, IPG, BBB, Cornerstone, nobody has a clue. But Chelsea, everybody has an opinion, or a lot of people have an opinion, particularly <laughs> in Europe. Um, we were, we, I, I would say that you know, we knew this was going to be a transaction that was going to be a lot more visible, a lot more high profile. Um, we purposely uh, have not been front and center in many ways in, in the transaction. And you know, our partner, Todd Boley, uh, is the chairman of the business. He has done a great job so far. Of, uh, of leading us through what was a very difficult transition, right? You know, uh, ownership transition, uh, and and more recently a, a coach uh, transition, which uh, was interesting. Um, I think that there's been some pluses and minuses, to be perfectly honest with you. I think it uh, it definitely has increased our profile significantly in Europe, Middle East, uh, Asia, here in the U.S. That's a little bit as well, though. You know, obviously. Uh, football or, or soccer uh, it's a little bit less popular here than than, than other places in the world um, but you know again you know we were comfortable with it because at the end of the day we think it fits very well uh, with our investment strategy and we think that the potential for value creation is very significant uh, and again it fits very well with what we do so so we're very comfortable with it uh, it definitely is unique, right? You know, when uh, you get to watch every week and kind of get a feeling for how well or how badly you're doing, right? You know, that's yeah. a unique perspective. Normally, you wait until the end of the month to get the the, the report from the CEO and the CFO. Here, uh, you, you get to watch it on TV. But but ultimately, uh, what we're trying to build uh, is a long-term, sustainable business that kind of create in value significantly. And that means a lot more than just winning or losing at the pitch. That's important right. uh, as a brand, as a media property, as a, as a, as a team, as a club. Uh, but we're also trying to establish and build or put in place the right building blocks to have a great business, you know, kind of in three years, five years, seven years. And a lot of the work that we're doing is behind the scenes trying right. to do just that. And so, and, and it is notable, and I think important for, for people in this room to understand if they don't, that... You did make this investment through the fund, mm -hmm. and and this wasn't an, an individual, um, and so that does bring with it a different set of responsibilities, it, I would imagine, and and different because you're having to talk about this with your LPs, not just with like your family. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. We uh, the, we think we have an incredible opportunity to uh, double revenue. You know, to we we think we we have in our hands, you know, one of the best media properties. Uh, and sports properties in the world, you know, where we can get to a billion dollars or billion pounds, actually, uh, of revenue. We think uh, we have hidden assets. For example, uh, the, we have the Chelsea women's uh, football team, football club. And that's probably, you know, arguably a top three uh, women's football club in the world. Um, it's a completely undervalued asset uh, right now. You know, there's no reason why uh, that property should not be uh, you know, kind of producing several hundred million dollars of revenue and, and, and in its own right being a billion dollar plus or at least a half a billion dollar plus uh, media property. So, so we think that there's a lot of opportunities, you know, kind of embedded in, 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 in the company that we bought. Mm -hmm. Again, it just happens to be Chelsea Football Club, a club that in some cases has, you know, fans that have been fans for or the family has been a fan for five generations, right? Yeah. So, so that's what's unique, right? You know, and, and we care about our supporters. That's extremely 
uh, important for us. It's part of the DNA of the club. And uh, we are not going to be successful if we leave our supporters and fans behind. So, so, so that's unique, right? You know, where you have a different type of stakeholder that you normally wouldn't have in other companies. Um, but then again, you know, we're used to having stakeholders. You know, there's, there's employees, there's customers, suppliers. In every company, you have different type of stakeholders. Just so happen to hear a very significant stakeholders that support their fan base. Yeah. But probably in your other companies, you don't have um, employees or customers like screaming at you on the street. But may, I don't know, maybe, maybe you don't. Um, all right, so I want to ask you this question that, that we pose the audience as well, um, which is the best long-term investment is a team in which pro league? I confess I came up with this because I wanted to hear your answer. Um, and so I dare say you may agree with this. So number one... NFL, number two, EPL. Uh, oh, actually, number three, much a tie. MLS. <laughs> yeah, and then number four, NBA. Okay, what do, if you if you took this? If I had this to rank quiz, it, yeah. You know, so so we have a lot of respect for the NFL. Uh, it is probably the best run uh, league in the in the world. Um, the dynamics and the interplay and how uh, revenue is distributed in each one of these leagues is a little bit different. So I would say that the NFL, if you take any uh, a generic NFL team that may be the best investment in the world, right? You know, you're one out of 32 uh, teams, and you get uh, one out of 32, uh, you know, one over 32 uh, share of the revenue of the NFL forever. That's a great, great investment. Yeah, I think the prospects for the NFL are fantastic, and the league has done uh, a good job or a great job of addressing some of the issues that they have had in the past. I think the English Premier League. I think you have to analyze it a little bit on a team-by-team -team basis. Mm -hmm. But as a group of, uh, or as a league, uh, I do think that it is arguably has the most upside in the world. Um, so, so the Super Bowl is probably watched by 150 plus million people. Well, every week we broadcast our games to over 180 countries to over 800 million people. The World Cup is going to happen in November, right? The, the final of the World Cup is going to be watched by over a billion people in the world. Those numbers are staggering, right? The Chelsea Football Club alone has about 120 or, you know, over 100 million social media followers. So, so, so the impact, the global reach uh, that we have in the English Premier League, particularly the top six or seven teams, uh, is unique, impossible to replicate by pretty much any other team in any other league. So, so I think we do have... Uh, a really important base. Um, the broadcast revenues, when you think about broadcasting, when you think about, you know, the future of sports, you know, kind of potentially betting, potentially uh, the idea of consuming space, uh, you know, as my partner Taboli would say, you know, less from a wholesale basis, but, you know, in a retail basis, i.e., you know, each one of those 100 million plus social media followers being able to access, um, uh, you know, snippets of the game or the backstories. You know, we have seen, obviously, how uh, live content can transform a sport. You know, we were talking about Formula One and Drive uh, to Survive earlier in our conversation backstage. Um, there's a million great stories, you know, to tell about, about our league, which I think have not been told. Mm -hmm. And you see snippets of that, or you see, you know, kind of uh, the beginning of that in, in series like All or Nothing, you know, in Amazon Prime, et cetera. But, uh, but I think the potential for, for global impact to create a global business uh, in the English Premier League, and, and we think Chelsea is the right vehicle for that, is, is, is amazing, and, and we're, it's just the beginning. And so as you think about the, the balance of this year, we've got less than a minute left. Um, sounds like tumult, turmoil, in, 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 in the broadest sense. Like, what's your sort of mode as we you know, as we round out 22 here? Well, I think um, in times of significant turmoil, significant uh, uncertainty is oftentimes when you find the best opportunities to invest. Uh, but it's certainly a time to, uh, to, to invest with kind of the, 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 the yellow blinking caution sign on, right? You know, um, those opportunities we think are going to be idiosyncratic, you know, kind of the, the macro type of opportunity that we, for example, saw the summer of 2020, it's not yet there, in our opinion. 
Um, but I think there are going to be interesting opportunities, and we are looking very closely at, you know, kind of at idiosyncratic opportunities in our core sectors, technology, industrials, the narrow set of the consumer set. Uh, and I think some of probably the best deals of the next, you know, kind of three, four years are going to happen in the next uh, probably two or three quarters.